Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. If you can take your seats for this uh, press conference of the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, I think you have a uh, translation. I hope so, because my English is not so good, but my Portuguese is even worse. So I do apologize. Um, <laughs> we're here today to launch the uh, fifth version, number five, of UNEP's Global Environment Outlook. And we have a very distinguished panel here to uh, present the findings, but also reflect on the state of the science, the state of the environment, from also a Brazilian perspective. And this report is deliberately being launched in advance of Rio Plus 20, because in a sense, um, we hope in a polite way, but in a scientifically honest way, to remind the world leaders coming in a few weeks' time why they are coming, and why they need to define an impressive outcome for everybody in the world. My name is Nick Nuttall, I'm the spokesperson of the United Nations Environment Programme. What I'm going to do is uh, ask, uh, firstly, uh, Liz Thompson, who is the uh, Executive Coordinator for the UN uh, Rio Plus 20 Conference, to uh, give us five minutes on the UN system and how it looks to Rio Plus 20, how it expects an outcome, and what that outcome might look like, or fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. And let me thank Akeem Steiner for his very kind invitation to this event, to the presentation of the GEO report, and indeed to the is that better? <laughs> I'm sure that you've heard my words of appreciation for Nick's kind introduction and to Akeem for his invitation to this event uh, as we are not now on the road to Rio but very much in Rio on the eve of this very important global conference. And I think that this setting this morning is important because the launch of this report helps to signify to countries, to companies, to citizens, to leaders, why it is we are here at Rio and what it is the global population is calling on us to do and to deliver. GEO5 presents for us the, the state of the planet, and it shows the environmental, the economic, the social considerations from not taking the appropriate decisions in the next few days. And I want to thank UNEP for their tremendous leadership in the uh, staging of this conference and in the role they have played in the production of some excellent reports and thought pieces and excellent documentation to help us to come to grips with the status of the world at this time in the framing of solutions for our current challenges and in helping us to see what the world will be like after, after real. And therefore you ask what it is that Rio is supposed to deliver. This conference here in your country and in this country is supposed to deliver. The invitation today asked me to speak on the hope for Rio. And I think that that is so appropriate. It reminded me of that wonderful speech by Martin Luther King in which he said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I am living a nightmare. He didn't say that I want to get out of the nightmare. He said, I have a dream. And we have come to Rio because we at the United Nations have a hope that this conference can be a platform which serves to transition the world from an economy, an economy anchored on fossil fuels, to, a world, to an economy which causes us to have greater respect for our natural resources, 
for the rate at which we consume them, an economy and a, a society, a global society, in which there will be greater investment in human and social and natural capital, a society in which we are valuing that capital and the role that it plays in our wider development. We hope, therefore, that Rio Plus 20 will launch a new platform for business, where businesses understand that sustainability equals prosperity. We hope that it will create a new level of engagement for the business sector and for civil society. That people across the globe who rose in the Arab Spring, in the Occupy Wall Street movement, who are living in the wake of the social and financial crisis, will find a new level of hope and a way in which they can hereafter live with greater sustainability, live with a sense of dignity and social justice, no matter where in the world they are born, where some people will not live at the apex of consumption, while others live in absolute poverty and despair. Real Plus 20 is supposed to be a transforming moment the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has described it as a once-in-a-generation opportunity. It is a once-in-a-generation opportunity for us to take decisions that will create that change. We hope that at the end of this conference, leaders will have taken decisions on critical issues relating to water, relating to energy, relating to food security, relating to oceans, relation, relating to sustainability generally, and that the world will agree a new set of goals. Some people call them sustainable development goals. I don't. I just call them global sustainability goals or global development goals which incorporates somehow the Millennium Development Goal platform and a new set of sustainable development goals which will take us across the globe to a new level of prosperity. At the end of the day, Rio Plus 20 is about creating and delivering on a new level of hope and action that will bring prosperity to our planet and all the people who live on it. And I thank Akeem and his team for the role that they have played and for those today with me as the producers of Geo5 for helping to frame the context in which that hope and the actions necessary to deliver on it are defined for us in clear, scientific, and certain terms. And I'm absolutely delighted to participate in this, the first event, which I think brings us onto the new platform that Rio Plus 20 will deliver. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Um, so now we're going to go to the uh, meat uh, of the uh, sandwich, as they say, because now we're coming to the science. And um, Fatimata uh, Kaiti Ruani, who is a, a chief of the scientific assessment branch uh, for UNEP, is going to go through the findings of GEO5. It's a report that's been many, many uh, months and years in preparation. Uh, it's the fifth report. There was a first report some years after the Rio Earth <laughs> Summit, and in total there have been four before this. This is the fifth. And Fatimata, if you can give us the findings. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Nick. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson, for your inspiring words. And, uh, one dear. Uh, I have uh, a device here which I'm using, and probably the group there to look at media starting the presentation. The GEO is UNEP's response 
to the mandate given to it by the Indian General, the United Nations uh, General Assembly to keep the world environment under review. What does it do? It translates the needs of the policy makers for the scientific community to provide responses. It translates the science for policy makers to base decision. And the fifth edition of it, I have to know. I guess I have to move, excuse me, because uh, uh, my... Uh, I'm pointing that way. Yeah, I'm pointing that way. It doesn't... All of the tech... The tech but yeah, I could... Oh. <coughs> Yeah, okay, please do that, yeah. Can you see me? Sorry for that. But I'll continue. And uh, this global environment outlook has the uh, uh, ambition to provide, as we are entering in the uh, Conference on Sustainable Development, to provide to the policy makers the scientific basis of where are we today in terms of environment, environmental degradation, responses to the environmental problems. And this GU especially has looked at the state in terms of environment, has also looked at policies, which is the first time, and has looked at the goals that the international community has set for itself during the past 20 years through agreements, treaties, through conferences, to achieve sustainability, sustainable development. Where have you, are we now? How much have we done in relation to these goals? Is the ambition of this GEO to provide information to the world decision makers? The document uh, that we will be looking at and we will present it later is organized according to three parts. The first part is the state and trends of the environment, which is uh, covers of five thematic areas, atmosphere, land, water, biodiversity, and chemicals and waste for the first time. Chemicals and waste because uh, it's uh, emerging issues are related to this field. So that was the part, uh, the first part of GEO, which talks about the state and trends of the environment. The second part of it talks about the regional policies. The regional groups uh, have uh, collected determined priority areas for each region, so, and they have uh, come with uh, regional policies. We can go back to the last slide. They have come back with regional policies that are promising, existing policies that are good to address environmental problems. We know that uh, tools exist. Not everything has to be crafted from zero. There is a need for political will to scale them up. If you can go back, please. And the third part of the GEO looks at uh, the outlook towards the future and uh, some possible solutions to implement uh, at global level. You can stay here because what we do is that uh, we look at uh, a driver's approach to the issue of environmental degradation. For many years, people have addressed environmental problems looking at the symptoms, and they forget the fundamental drivers, the fundamental, the root causes of why we have degradation. And this GEO has put a focus on the drivers. What are they? It's the population, it's urbanization, it's globalization. It's also the fabulous technological development, which is good news. But doing so, we put a pressure in the environment and the growth, physical and financial growth that we have seen so far, has come at the cost of the environment. The GEO has analyzed that and is proposing some solutions. So looking at drivers in with a nerve perspective. In this part one, in the state of the environment, we have already passed one that I wanted to show you. When we look at the state of the environment, it's not for the search of pristine garden. It's not for beautifying. It's really relating environment to the life-supporting needs of human population. 
and one of the slides that passed was referring related to fish stocks. When we look from 1992 to 2012, we see that uh, fish stocks that were overexploited in 1992, the percentage has increased and from 30% we are now at more than 40% of over-exploited fish stocks. The fish stocks that were under-exploited were about around 30% in 1992 and today they are around 15%, which means that there is a clear deterioration of the situation. When we look at that, it's not environment. We're talking about economic. The fishery, capture fishery, in the first, last part of uh, last century, they have quadrupled their catches from 1950 to 1990. And after that, the catches have reduced. Why? They are doing more fishing effort, but they are not catching more fish. They are catching less fish, which is an economic problem. And if we continue, we can't sustain this trend chemicals and waste, we have a real problem. Production and consumption is increasing much more in developing countries, and the analysis has shown there are impacts. 4.9 million deaths in 2004, according to the World Health Organization study, can be related to chemical exposure. Electronic waste, emerging problem. And the quantity of electronic waste is between 20 to 50 million, actually. And this is a serious problem. And this, if we don't look at how to deal with it, we are leading ourselves to travel. So there are solutions. When we look at electronic waste, it's full of useful resources. And we call that urban mine. We can use them. We can solve the problem. And we will. After this one, if we can continue, can I have the next slide? Maybe it works this time. We have also looked uh, during the geo production process at the realization of the more than 500 agreed goals, environmentally agreed goals uh, that the world has been achieved. So I will not go into the details, you have them in your documents. But uh, this is, again, a frightening situation. We have uh, analyzed 90 of them in details, and we find out that uh, we can see significant progress only for four of them. The Millennium Development Goal for the access to safe drinking water, the reduction of ozone depleting substances, elimination of lead in gasoline, and uh, the proportion of people who that have access to food are before. And uh, the most frightening, besides the little progress and no progress, is when we have insufficient data. Next slide, please. The analysis has shown that there is uh, a data gap that's tremendous. We need monitoring, we need data to support uh, evidence-based policy. What we can't measure cannot be managed, and this is from our friend Albert Einstein. At his time, he knew that already. Right? And this is still valid. Next slide, please. The second part of the CHIO, as I told you, is covering the solutions, policies that exist, that are implemented, and that can be scaled up and to address many, many of the environmental problems. Solutions have been provided through regions. Next slide, please. I will just show you some examples. You can go through those slides. It's to show that work is being done in West Africa supporting uh, fisheries. In uh, Asia, there are uh, uh, work to, uh, yeah, <laughs> removal of fossil fuel subsidies, which is important to promote uh, alternative uh, uh, energy sources. And when we go to the next, and to the next, in Brazil, there have been efforts through financial mechanism to reduce deforestation. So the world is working. Let's go to the next. Cap and trade, putting financial value to, to the environment, to, to ecosystem services, to protect and to stimulate resource generation. This is an example from North America and next. Europe is also working. These are only but a few examples 
to show you what is being done all over the world. And we can go to the next. Because these policies, they do succeed. They succeed with enabling conditions. What makes a successful policy? If you go to the next one, we will see the division of uh, uh, enablers and uh, policies that have financial incentive, governance in place, multi-country collaboration, payment for ecosystem service, participatory approaches show the most promises uh, for addressing the problems and providing solutions. And when we look at uh, these enablers, they surprisingly not. These are the enablers for a green economy environment. So we call it the way we want. The enablers, there are systems, there are things to do in order to succeed. And this is what we are talking about. And next, please. Geo part three, and I'm getting close to the end for the uh, watchman. Geo part three provides the outlook towards the future. And next slide. It has looked at what is called conventional scenarios, which actually is business as usual scenario. If we don't do things differently, where are we going? If we don't do things differently, the state of the environment is going down. And it looked also at sustainability scenarios, which are scenarios that will help us reach the 2050 goals and change trajectory. And doing that, in order to change trajectory, there are a number of things that we have to do, but the GEO says we need also to change mindset. Shifting the mindset is extremely important. We can't do it all by command control, by rules, regulation. We need to change our mindset. And changing the mindset can be done among other things, through youth education. Bringing environment and sustainable development in school curricula is one of the ways that the GEO gives in order to change mindset. There are others. Now, looking at other types of uh, solutions, and uh, GEO recommends that, that we need also to infuse result-based management into our environmental actions. If we look at the next slide, some of the policy solutions that are here, I will just take you through. Framing environmental goals in the context of sustainable development, Ms. Thompson spoke about, it's not just buzzword, it's really establishing a goal framework that integrates the contribution of environment into development and poverty reduction. It's not done sufficiently up to now and we need this framework. Enhancing the effectiveness of global institutions is not just buzzword. It means we need to infuse more science in the policy interface. It also means that institutions should be brought more in line uh, in an integrated manner. I'm not going to talk about institutional changes, about governments, much will be said about it in the coming days and weeks, but I'll just quote a review that says that only in the United Nations system there are huge resources and capacity that are engaged for environmental activities, they are not brought together. If we would integrate uh, this approach around a strategy, much can be achieved. So there is work to do. Investing in capacity, technical assistance is being done uh, everywhere, but technical assistance traditionally, which means giving support is not enough. We need to create real knowledge sharing system we need to create things like roadmap, a green economy roadmap. We need a UN-wide framework for capacity development, policy banks where people can access to best case studies done elsewhere and then share this experience. And next please. And still to anchor a result-based approach in the international process. If you click next please. We have environmental, supporting environmental sound technology. What could be done? We need to be creative and innovative. 
global prize funds to stimulate innovation on green economic technologies, for example, is a proposal. It has to be studied, but when we talk about green economy, one of the fears and concerns are how do we access to the green technologies? These are the fears from developing countries. What are the patent issues? We can create innovative ways to support the stimulation and this innovation of the green technologies. Strengthening right-based approach is important. Human right, right to access to some goods. South Africa, one of the uh, successful policies in the document, shows how success South Africa is resolving the access to drinking water through right approach, right-based approach. You need every person should have access to drinking water at a distance of 200 meters from his her home. And this is one of the aspects of right-based approach. And of course, we need to deepen and broaden stakeholder engagement, not only information sharing, but really engaging them from the decision-making process. Um, next slide, please. Here, Rio Plus 20, the future front, and we subtitled the GEO environment for because we think environment is an integral point. Science policy phase, UNEP brings the science. UNEP takes the policy to the scientific. And it says that ambitious set of sustainable targets can be met, but only with renewed commitment. We are here for that. In rapid scaling up of successful policies, we have identified some of them for you. Next, please. And uh, I... Thank you very much, Moto Brigado. I don't know if we call this uh, a, a fortress. I like the French word. I'm basically French speaking, which you have heard from my accent. I like the French word of uh, order. And that means something that's out of the masterpiece. The masterpiece is here, and I invite you to get to it. We have electronic versions, we have spin-off products, and they will give you most of the information. And uh, it has been my pleasure to share this with you. Thank you very much. As you can see, there's a there's a lot in this report. It's impossible to go through every single fact and figure, but uh, I hope that you have the press release. It's got a lot of data in it. I hope you have it in Portuguese. There are also regional fact sheets, uh, which also cover uh, this region, which hopefully is available at the back. And if you don't have it, then please ask one of the staff here with UNEP Numa to supply you with the press materials if you don't have them. Uh, now, I'm very delighted to have, have um, Carlos Nogre. He's National Secretary for Scientific Policy at the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. He's going to give us five minutes to sense on planetary boundaries and tipping points that may be coming in this world. Good morning to all. Thank you very much uh, to UNEP for this the kind of invitation to be here for the launch is very important uh, for the benefits of most of you in the audience I will switch to Portuguese so you can understand what I'm going to say please get your, your headphones uh, let me get up muito brevemente em cinco minutos é o de forma resumida o conhecimento científico atual uh, que se traduz num senso de urgência muito grande e a expectativa que a Rio mais 20 ela consiga uh, entender esse senso de urgência que os líderes políticos que a sociedade civil entendam o senso de urgência porque eu, em muitos aspectos, e eu vou mostrar alguns dados muito rapidamente, de fato, 
Nós já passamos do ponto em que nós poderemos exercer e implementar o futuro que nós queremos. Talvez não seja possível mais implementar o futuro que nós queremos ou o sonho. Em outros pontos, nós estamos muito próximos desses limites, que, que, é o, que são os limites planetários. E o, e o conceito de limites planetários, ou, ou em inglês, é, tipping points, quer dizer, os, os pontos que nós não deveríamos cruzar, é simples, com essa figura de uma pessoa à, à beira de uma, de uma queda d'água, e, e se um geek se romper por cima, essa, essa pessoa vai varrida e vai cair na queda d'água. Se depois parar a, o tsunami da água, essa pessoa não volta ao ponto original. É um conceito muito simples, mas é um conceito... É muito complicado, você tem que trazer a pessoa, se ela for viva ainda, tem que trazer de volta e gastar muita energia, e às vezes não é possível. O conceito de tipping points ele é muito importante para entender alguns dos limites que nós já estamos chegando próximos e alguns nós ultrapassamos. O próximo slide, por favor. Essa análise é, de 2009, Rockstrom et al., publicado na Nature, ela vai muito na linha do, da análise desse relatório. O relatório é muito mais extensivo, analisou muito mais parâmetros, aqui é um sumário é, qualitativo de, desses vários, várias áreas ambientais do sistema terrestre, por exemplo, a atmosfera, a poluição química, mudanças climáticas, acidificação dos oceanos, a, o ozônio na estratosfera, ciclo de nitrogênio, ciclo de fósforo, o, o uso de água a, e, a, e mudança dos usos da terra. Uh, qualitativamente, um grupo muito grande de cientistas, não muito diferente da estratégia usada nesse relatório, é, estabeleceu essa linha verde como o, o espaço de operação segura para a humanidade e para o planeta. E identificou que alguns desses, dessas mudanças ambientais globais, nós já estamos muito longe desse, dessa operação segura. Onde nós estamos mais longe? Perda de biodiversidade. Essa nós já estamos perdendo espécies numa taxa alarmante. E nós nem ainda chegamos ao ponto das mudanças climáticas afetarem muito a perda de biodiversidade. Mas nós já cedemos de muito os limites seguros de erosão da diversidade da vida na Terra. Ciclo de nitrogênio, cedemos completamente. Hoje, nitrogênio jogado por ações humanas já é bem maior que todo o nitrogênio fixado por todas as plantas que fixam nitrogênio. E mudanças climáticas também, ainda que em menor dimensão. Outros nós estamos próximos, como o ciclo de fósforo, a acidificação do oceano, que está acontecendo em uma taxa alarmante, e que certamente, se não diminuirmos a emissão de gás de CO2 na atmosfera, vamos exceder esse limite nas próximas décadas. Então, esse é um, isso mostra que a questão não é só o futuro que nós queremos, a questão é se nós conseguimos, dentro do futuro, nós queremos trazer de volta para dentro do espaço verde. Então, é, essa é uma grande é, questão científica, mas ela é muito mais política e é o próprio desejo da sociedade global se nós realmente queremos ficar dentro desse espaço seguro. Eu vou agora mostrar só a repercussão de uma dessas dimensões que tem mudanças climáticas em uma escala regional, para vocês entenderem é, um pouco melhor quão próximo quão, ou quão distante nós estamos de alguns desses limites planetários. Próximo, próximo, desculpa, só para mostrar o que eu já falei, o próximo, próximo, mais uma vez. Então, isso, isso é só uma análise, olhando só o que pode acontecer regionalmente no planeta, alguns desses tipping points, é, que poderiam ser excitados ou, ou acontecer em função dos, principalmente das mudanças climáticas. Alguns nós estamos possivelmente muito distantes, outros nós estamos muito próximos. Onde nós estamos mais próximos? O desaparecimento do, do gelo flutuando em cima do Polo Norte. 
95% dos cientistas especializados eles dizem que antes do final do século não haverá mais gelo durante o verão do hemisfério norte. Isso é uma tremenda de uma mudança. Isso afeta o clima global, isso afeta o clima do hemisfério norte, os padrões climáticos vão mudar e isso afeta a vida polar marinha. Então, esse é um, é um tipping point que a maior, a maior parte da comunidade científica especializada diz que não há mais como reverter, mesmo com 2 graus de aumento da temperatura. E nós temos vários outros que, se eles forem, se acontecerem, eles causam uma mudança que sairá do controle humano. Por isso, o futuro que nós queremos não é só o sonho que nós queremos para o planeta do desenvolvimento sustentável ou da procura da sustentabilidade global. É, existe um sentido de urgência. O futuro que nós queremos não estará esperando por nós indefinidamente. O futuro que nós queremos ele tem que acontecer urgentemente. E para finalizar, eu só quero pegar um desses pontos que infelizmente eu não tenho tempo de falar de todos. O mais próximo realmente é o gelo polar, mas vários outros poderão uh, ser desencadeados, principalmente essas perdas de metano ou de gás carbônico de grandes reservatórios que acelerariam muito as mudanças climáticas. E para finalizar, eu quero trazer a questão um pouquinho mais para, o, para cá, para o Brasil. Próximo. Próximo. É, a... Não, volta um. Eu só quero mencionar aqui, ó. Há muitos estudos científicos, estudos que eu mesmo uh, participo, para estudar se a floresta amazônica ter, poderia desaparecer. E, e, e nós chegamos a algumas conclusões, que existem sim thresholds, limites, para a floresta amazônica. E dois, já existem uma boa quantificação. A floresta não resistiria a aquecimento na Amazônia acima de 4 graus, a temperatura na Amazônia já subiu um grau, mais ou menos. E a floresta também não resistiria se o desmatamento na Amazônia ultrapassar 40% da área da floresta. Esses são os tipping points hoje quantificados para a nossa belíssima floresta amazônica. Nossa, não do Brasil, mas da humanidade. Uh, esse aqui, vocês viram, talvez o, o resultado mais importante de tudo que é mitigação de, de gases de efeito de estufa, foi o resultado da diminuição dos desmatamentos tropicais, principalmente na América do Sul, especialmente no Brasil, ontem foi, foi anunciado, isso dava um grande orgulho para todos os brasileiros. Então, vamos dizer até que a gente consiga não chegar, nós estamos com 18% de desmatamento, que os países amazônicos tenham políticas de desenvolvimento sustentável e não passem muito desse número, 20%. Mas ainda assim, 4 graus de aumento da temperatura global é completamente fora do controle dos países detentores da floresta. Então, um esforço global, se nós queremos ter uma floresta como a Amazônia em toda a biodiversidade e todos os recursos que ela conserva a longo prazo, não, não, não é necessário, não é, é suficiente só uma ação de políticas públicas dos países amazônicos. É, é necessário e fundamental uma política pública global que reduz o risco do aquecimento passar de muito de 2 graus. Então, eu só queria é, destacar ah, e finalizar novamente, reiterando a importância de que o futuro que nós queremos não estará esperando por nós indefinidamente. As ações têm que começar ontem e, e nós estamos ainda vivendo uma inércia 20 anos depois e essa inércia tem que ser quebrada. E que a Rio Mais 20 seja o momento de quebrar essa inércia. Muito obrigado. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Carlos. Um, now we have uh, Carlos. <coughs> now we have uh, Carlos de Klink. He's a uh, National Secretary for Climate Change and Environmental Quality uh, at the Ministry of the Environment. He's uh, going to speak uh, somewhat about uh, some of the other challenges related to uh, Brazil, in a sense, and climate and, and, and science. Are you doing it from the podium? Okay, fine. We have no slides. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for time, NEP, uh, all the team, uh, UNEP, Brazil. Uh, as Carlos said, I'll, I'll be speaking in Portuguese as well, uh, if you need translation. Um, <coughs> dada essa demonstração muito clara vindo da ciência, 
uh, seja no relatório uh, que está, nos está sendo apresentado hoje, o GEL 5, com uma base científica uh, bastante grande, ou dos esforços científicos, dos esforços científicos que acontecem aqui no Brasil, o desafio está é bastante claro e, e se põe de uma maneira talvez até maior. Uh, ontem, na, na leitura do, do, da parte do relatório do resumo para tomadores de decisão, é, vocês vão ver depois na capa do, do relatório se desenhar o mapa mundo com os temas mais importantes, feito com palavras, e aí você tem um desenho do mapa mundo. Na, na parte para tomadores de decisão, eu elenquei, eu fui, fui lendo cada um dos temas, e tem aqui 30 temas, ou seja, é uma situação que se, da maneira que se coloca bastante complexa para aqueles que estão um pouco mais na fronteira, os tomadores de decisão ah, com base na ah, tomar decisão com base em conhecimento e na melhor ciência disponível possível. Esse é o primeiro ponto que eu gostaria de, 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 de destacar. Mais e mais essa fronteira para os tomadores de decisão, ela deve, ela tem que se fazer uh, baseada em fatos e do melhor conhecimento científico disponível. E que já vem acontecendo, porque uh, uh, eu, eu tento sempre também tra tentar trazer um pouco uma visão, bom, mas e aí o que se faz? E, uh, talvez até um pouco tentar também ser otimista com, com alguns resultados que, que podem ser alcançados e que já estão sendo alcançados, dado que a gente conhece o cenário. Uma questão é estabelecer, se colocar-se ah, essa fotografia, esse, esse, esse diagnóstico, esse destaque, essas tendências. E a outra questão é como e, e, e por qual caminho tomar as decisões. Primeiro, baseado em conhecimento. De fato, isso é fundamental. Mais e mais no Ministério do Meio Ambiente, mais a interação com outros ministérios e a, na interação com outros membros da sociedade brasileira, seja sociedade civil, sociedade de conhecimento e inclusive o setor privado, mais e mais a gente está se municiando desse tipo de informação para trazer, para conseguir, para lograr no diálogo da tomada de decisão a melhor decisão possível uh, e geralmente negociada uh, dado o uh, país democrático como o nosso. Uh, o outro ponto que eu gostaria de destacar, que eu acho bastante importante, é, é uma coisa é você ter o relatório, nós lemos o relatório, nos darmos conta da, 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 do grau de, cer de, de certeza, às vezes é muito baseado no grau de incerteza, que também, que também é importante para tomar decisão, ainda assim temos que tomar decisão, é que eu acho bastante importante uh, nesse trabalho é o engajamento, é o processo. Não é apenas temos o retrato, aqui está o retrato e passa, passamos essa responsabilidade para frente. Eu acho que esse tipo de resultado, como está sendo apresentado aqui hoje no relatório do GEL, é fundamental não só pelo que ele mostra em termos de, dessa fotografia, mas é a, a capacidade de cada um de nós e cada uma das nossas instituições para tomar a decisão, se engajar no processo. E o relatório ele é bastante feliz nesse sentido, porque ele aponta já nesse caminho, como foi apresentado aqui, como foi apresentado aqui anteriormente. E isso é muito importante, porque para aqueles que tomam a decisão, eles têm que sentir, ele tem que sentir que ele está sendo, ele ou ela está sendo engajado nesse processo de tomar, de tomar a decisão com base naquela, na melhor ciência disponível. Como é que eles, muito felizmente, estão tentando buscar fazer isso aqui no relatório? que para nós é, é bastante pertinente. Uh, trazendo experts locais, muito importante, muito importante a participação da ciência brasileira, a participação do, do conhecimento brasileiro, por exemplo, ou dos, de, de qualquer outro país que faça parte desse tipo de relatório. Qual outra maneira? Uh, uh, muito importante mostrar, mostrar não só um relatório de escala global, o um contexto global bastante claro, mas também que tem uh, nuances, condições particulares de regiões ou de países ou de ecossistemas que têm suas características. Isso, se a gente também trabalha nesse sentido, a gente engaja cada vez mais o tomador de decisão e os outros que querem participar dentro da sociedade tomando de decisão. Uh, para que, que o relatório seja realmente, esse tipo de relatório seja realmente efetivo. Uma outra maneira que eu achei bastante pertinente, que foi, foi relatada aqui nas apresentações, é, eu acho sempre importante, eu tenho trabalhado muito, uh, tanto no meio, eu venho do meio acadêmico, tanto 
mas não só no meio acadêmico, mas também no meio daqueles que estão tentando trazer o resultado acadêmico para operacionalização, para busca de resultados, é contar boas histórias. Claro que a situação está bastante clara. A ciência que estamos colocando não é de hoje, a situação de uma maneira bastante clara e bastante crítica, no certo sentido. Mas tem muitas histórias uh, também boas que a gente deve reportar. O relatório também que trata isso nessa escala regional. Se a gente faz essa combinação de conhecimento científico, esse engajamento com exemplos locais, engajamento de expertise local, Uh, treinamento local e bons resultados parciais que sejam locais o engajamento do tomador de decisão com certeza vai ser maior, vai ser aumentado tá? é, eu gostaria de destacar, já que foi, já foi colocado mais de uma vez e foi reportado ontem na, na inauguração do dia mundial do meio ambiente, que está nos presentes com a presidente da república no palácio do planalto e foi colocado um trabalho conjunto que é realizado não é de hoje a combinação de metodologia, ciência, tecnologia, tomar decisão política, a, a, a trazer várias partes da sociedade em conjunto, colocar mais de um ministério trabalhando em conjunto, inclusive com outros membros da sociedade, logramos hoje o que eu estava comentando com o Stein há um tempo atrás, se me perguntassem cinco, seis anos atrás, se o Brasil seria capaz de reduzir o desmatamento, as taxas que a gente tem reduzido hoje na Amazônia, eu diria que dificilmente, mas hoje a gente vê que isso é uma realidade. Claro, a gente vai continuar trabalhando nesse sentido, é, mas mostra que essa combinação da melhor informação possível e ela tratada e operacionalizada de uma certa maneira um, estratégica, logística, ela, ela sim dá resultados. É suficiente? Provavelmente não. E também foi colocado no relatório que, que temos que pensar o que está por vir. E já estamos pensando no que está por vir. Por exemplo, é frequentemente relatado aqui no Brasil, provavelmente o relatório traz um pouco desse tipo de informação, não é só o caso do Brasil, mas vários outros, de vários países, mas o Brasil é bastante, bastante tipo. Já estamos pensando em pensamento conjunto, não apenas o Ministério do Meio Ambiente, mas alguns ministérios com a academia e com o setor privado, é, já é bastante relatado na, na literatura, inclusive científica, da enorme quantidade de terras degradadas que temos nesse país. É, o ano passado foi lançado o um relatório para a Amazônia Brasileira, já estamos trabalhando para lançar o um relatório ah, para o Cerrado e para outras, particularmente no Cerrado, que é o, por um lado é uma grande benesse em termos de produção agrícola do Brasil, foi uma grande conquista, sem, sem dúvida, da, da economia da agricultura brasileira, mas temos também grande que muitos pesquisadores, inclusive chamam de, da, da, da pior questão ambiental que temos encerrado, é que a quantidade enorme de áreas degradadas. O que fazer com essas áreas degradadas? É, é, esse tipo, é, é trabalhar num certo sentido de reincorporar, por exemplo, esse ativo ambiental que está com uma base produtiva, ou seja, qual, qual seja o conceito de base produtiva ou de degradação que utilizamos, muito baixa, e reintegrá-lo para dentro do... Uh, processo produtivo. É um ganho de eficiência, não é apenas a política pública de comando e controle, que dizendo se pode ou não pode, uh, mais desmatamento, mesmo que seja legal, mas nós temos hoje a capacidade técnica científica de reintegrar uma grande quantidade, uma enorme quantidade de terra, apenas com ganhos de produtividade, ganhos de eficiência. Eu acho que é esse tipo, e já estamos trabalhando nesse sentido, eu acho que é esse tipo de combinação tomar uma decisão com base científica, mas também já antevendo os próximos passos, é que a gente vai conseguir lograr uh, mostrar esses diferenciais para atingir aqueles, seus, uh, aqueles tentar atacar a vários desses problemas que foram muito bem colocados pelo lado da ciência. Ou seja, essa movimentação, esse trabalho contínuo, dinâmico, que é, é que é relevante. Meu último ponto, bastante breve. É, eu sei que o processo do, de, de, de elaboração do, do relatório Geo 5 já fez isso, já tem trabalhado nesse sentido, de engajamento. E, e quanto mais engajamento e capacitação, como foi colocado aqui pelos colegas, capacitação local, eu, eu até me atrevo a sugerir ao, ao, ao time da, da, do Penuma que tanto no Geo 5, mas já 
talvez pensando no processo do gel 6 durante o processo de elaboração do relatório, que também a gente trabalha no sentido de mais e mais trazer engajamento de cientistas locais, expertos locais para a elaboração do, dos próximos relatórios com esse tipo de visão. Não apenas de dar a fotografia, mas de mostrar, mostrar que há processos sim de tomar decisão que podem ser positivas e que através do engajamento eles vão trazer resultados bastante positivos e vão funcionar como exemplo. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, last but not least, um, we have uh, Achim Steiner, who is the UN Under Secretary General and the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, PNUMA. Um, Herr Steiner, if you give us your take on this. Okay, that's better. First of all, may I thank our very distinguished panel for their presentation this morning. As UNED, I must say we feel privileged, first of all, to have our colleague Liz Thompson here with us, who has day and night at the moment the preparations of the summit on her mind. But this report speaks directly to Rio Plus 20, and therefore her presence here symbolizes not just a unit report. This is a report of the United Nations Environment Program on behalf of the United Nations system as a contribution to this once in a generation conference that will take place in a few days' time in Rio. But I also want to acknowledge the presence of the two Carloses, if I may say so, because this report is also a departure from past reports. It speaks to a new understanding of an environmentalism of the 21st century. And it is not by coincidence that we are launching this report together here in Rio today alongside a number of other launches across the world, but this is the main launch. Not only because of Rio 1992, but because it is in a country like Brazil and in a region such as Latin America that some of the most fundamental decisions about the future of how we manage these trends are going to be taken in fact, are being taken today. In Latin America, we have already a situation where roughly a quarter of the world's forests are located and over a, or close to a third of the world's, world's water resources. So whatever happens on this continent here is integral and fundamental to our capacity globally to manage these issues. And I think that was the graph that most fascinated me was the summary of tipping points or thresholds that we are approaching today that will change things in a way that people still have difficulties to understand today. The Amazon debate is on the one hand a debate about trees, about people, about agriculture. It is a debate about hydropower and about water and the rivers. But it is beyond the biodiversity and the immediate economics of today's economy, a debate about how on earth will this continent cope with a situation that is now likely to occur, where the hydrological functions of this ecosystem, as the largest water pump on our planet, will cease to function in the way we know it today. Trying to get economists to calculate the risks to our economies and societies, in particular to South American economies and societies, of an ecosystem that ceases to operate maybe in 50 or 100 years in the way that we have known it to operate for thousands of years. Maybe the planet will cope with it. Our societies and our economies will not be able to cope with it. But I said to you at the beginning, our intent in publishing a different kind of GO5 report is not to move away from the hard facts, because that is the foundation of this report. The role of the United Nations Environment Program is to speak truth to power, but not based on ideology or debate, but on science and empirical evidence. Imperfect science, imperfect evidence. But I take you back to the diagram that was up there. Perfect knowledge is not a precondition for rational human action. If you take that diagram and you simply extrapolate the next 100 to 200 years of human history on this planet, and you ask yourself how history books will write about our generation when we have the choice in so many areas still to at least control some of these developments and then not act, 
That is truly an indictment. And let me say to you that in 1992, we talked about the future that was likely to occur. This report, 20 years later, speaks to the fact that a number of those things we talked about in the future tense in 1992 have arrived. They are part of the present. They are beginning to happen. And we can measure them. We can identify them. And we can observe the impacts they're beginning to have on our societies. That is the second part of the environmentalism of the 21st century that I would like to highlight here. That when we talk about these environmental changes on the planet, we talk about them in scientific and metric terms, but we also describe them in social and economic implication terms, because the age where environmentalism was confined or condemned or marginalized, you can use the word, word you prefer, to simply describing the failures of decision-making in terms of pollution and degradation and lack of action are over. The knowledge about the state of our planet, about how ecosystems function, how the atmosphere and the biosphere represent the foundations for the development paths of our nations, have made the environmental science and policy analysis arena fundamental to sustainable development, and not the luxury of develop first, clean up later. That age, that century is gone. We present to you today a report that also is in some ways shocking because 20 years after Rio 1992, on virtually all the mega trends that we describe, we cannot stand before our either elders or children and claim that the last 20 years have succeeded in turning these trends around. So to anyone who picks up this report, you should be surprised, you should be extremely concerned, and yes, you can also have the luxury of being shocked. Because this is, to some extent, an indictment of our inability with all that we have done. And you heard Fatimata speak about 500 multilateral environmental agreements, thousands of national acts of legislation, millions of political statements and commitments that have been made in the last 20 years. The fact is that the way our economies are evolving is outpacing our capacity as human beings, as societies, as body politic, to catch up with that reality. So that is, unfortunately, one of the hard messages of this report. But let me tell you what makes this report both a positive and a negative second message is that in these last 20 years, across the world, across every nation, across virtually every community, there have been examples that we actually can do differently. There are millions of examples, but that which we describe as the underlying trend of our global community today is not something we are condemned to continue. We have examples from cleaning up our energy matrix, to shifting transport systems from private to public, to turning to sustainable agriculture, to looking at how we can decouple production and consumption from pollution and resource consumption. We have those examples. And what you also saw in the diagram here is that we have learned very clearly that public policy is a critical part of stimulating the ability of societies and economies to move. And where we succeed, it is precisely where it was almost 40%, I think it was the diagram that we presented, where public policies and legislation and regulatory frameworks not in the sense of only command and control, but in enabling an economy to function more rationally and have succeeded in changing the way things happen. And since 1992, we are in an extraordinary situation, and next week we will release here in Rio de Janeiro the 2011 report on sustainable energy finance. And I can already tell you right now that a new record has been set in the world on the level of investments that took place last year in renewable energy. Already from 2010, we showed the world that total investments for renewable energy infrastructure exceeded those of oil, gas, and coal combined. This was an unthinkable scenario in 1992, at least by those who believed that our energy matrix of the 20th century is the only way for the next 100 years. Change is possible. And in this report, we show time and again that where political leaders, economic leaders, social leaders, take responsibility and begin to put in place a different policy framework in our economic and social arena, we can make these changes occur. That is why we also invested in this report to show with 100 policies that we have analyzed of success stories 
of how it was done, why it succeeded, and the degree to which it was able to change the course that our lives were in. And when I say to you today that we live in an age of irresponsibility, that is also testified and documented in this report, it is the fact that we have all this information about what is happening to our planet in the broader sense, but what is happening to people, to communities, and even more importantly, what we are condemning future generations to because once a tipping point occurs, you don't wake up the next morning and say, oh, this is terrible, can we please change it? That is the whole essence of these thresholds. We are condemning people to not having the choice anymore. In UNEP, I often say that we feel a little bit like a librarian who is documenting the state of the planet moving in the wrong direction. This GEO5 report is an antidote to that frustration of many who have spoken as scientists, as environmentalists, as human rights activists, or just as rational economists to the fact that this pathway on which we are moving collectively as, as a global community is simply not appropriate given what we know about what is happening and more importantly given what we know about what it is we can do successfully move in another direction. I also want to appeal to the People's Summit here in Rio because this report is not just a reason to be frustrated and to get angry with political leaders or with leaders in the private sector. This is, if you want, your most powerful tool to reach out to the majority of society that intuitively knows that something is going wrong but lacks the confidence in our ability to shift our economies onto a different path. I would like those activists who are preparing to come to Rio Plus 20 to protest and to also lament the inaction that we have seen to open up a second front and to take a report like this and say answer to the public why is it that we are not moving on these issues why is it that in a world where public expenditure today represents one-fifth to one-third of most governments or nations economies public procurement is still something that is behind where society is beginning to behave, namely sustainable public procurement. If governments were to pass the kinds of legislation and laws that President Dilma announced yesterday here in Brazil about sustainable public procurement, you would be amazed how quickly a market is created for more sustainable production and consumption, how businesses begin to invest, how new technologies come out of the drawers and are introduced into the factories and the markets of our society. But governments are also not leading with sufficient clarity and purpose. So we want the peoples of this world to have this support, not as something to get angrier or frustrated only. Yes, they need to pay attention to the facts and to use them, but use them as a way to reach out to society. Because at the end of the day, we can point fingers to anyone but it is our ability to convince society that there is not only an imperative to act, but there is actually an opportunity to act in a way that will allow development in the future to succeed for the benefit of small, large economies, industrialized economies and others. In that sense, GEO5, I hope, speaks to something that I said earlier on. In a country like Brazil, it is no accident that so many scientists are beginning to enter the public policy arena. Both Carlos Link and Carlos to his left are examples of that. Our friend Professor Brown, who is here, who has just been appointed the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. But I saw earlier on Professor Luis Miguel Rosa, Professor Emilio Larogre, who is also a contributor to this report. In Brazil, you have a very interesting moment because scientists are becoming engaged in public policy. And that is why you see in some domains Brazil taking a leadership role because science is beginning to define not only policy options but also implementation pathways. This is the core of the role of the United Nations Environment Program at the international level. Our role is to bring the best of science and analysis into the public policy arena in order to make better choices for better societies in the sense that environmental facts are not just for environmentalists, they are for everyone to make sustainable development not just another 20 years of aspiration, 
but with clear targets, goals, commitments that are measurable not only in the laboratories and universities, but in the public town halls of every city and every community. In that sense, thank you very much for your tremendous interest here this morning. This report is, in my mind, above all the sobering facts, a message of hope. We can succeed, but only if people begin to act on the facts. Thank you.